Hello. Today is Thursday, May 25th, 2023, and I'd like to welcome you back to another edition of the Kale Ortho podcast. Today's special guest is our very own Dr. Paul Boggy. Dr. Boggy is an orthopedic spine fellowship trained orthopedic surgeon at the Kale Orthopedic Center, and we're so privileged to have him here with us today. Dr. Boggy is a very highly trained, skilled, and accomplished orthopedic spine surgeon at the Kale Orthopedic Center. Dr. Boggy is extremely well educated and trained. He was educated at some of the most prestigious institutions in the country. Dr. Boggy started at the National Institutes of Health, also known as NIH. He did his undergraduate training at Cornell University and then went on to medical school in Yale University in Connecticut. After four years at Yale, he decided to stay on at Yale and do his orthopedic surgery uh, residency training for an additional five years at Yale University. After that, Dr. Boggy developed a uh, keen interest in the area of spinal disorders and spine surgery, and he went on to the University of California at San Diego and completed a spine fellowship training, and we're so excited that immediately after that, he decided to join the Kale Orthopedic Center. He's been with us now for a few years, and we've had a tremendous relationship. He's cared for so many of our patients, and we're just so privileged to have him here today. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Boggy. Thank you for the introduction, It's Dr. so Kale. great to have you. It's so great to have you. Thank you. Dr. Boggy is very well published in the orthopedic literature as well, and he even has a chapter in the textbook of spinal surgery on total disc replacements. Uh, and and uh, that's really uh, very exciting because today's topic is all about back pain and the etiologies of back pain and leg pain. You know, it's such a ubiquitous problem. It's like everyone you talk to, I don't know how many patients a day we see, we get new patients every single day complaining of back pain, leg pain, sciatica, spinal stenosis, different conditions. So we figured we just dive right in and uh, discuss you know, some of these very common conditions that we see each and every day. And uh, we're going to really work in earnest to try to discuss this and explain it to you, our community of listeners, in layman's terms. And so that you can really relate to uh, what we're saying, understand the anatomy involved in contributing to these back pain and leg pain disorders. And so we can help you get better as soon as possible. So let's just dive right in. We're gonna first start out, I'm gonna have Dr. Boggy give us a little brief anatomy lesson. I brought a spine model with me today and uh, Dr. Boggy will just uh, show us what the anatomical structures are. And then we'll talk later in this podcast about how those anatomical structures may in fact be contributing to your back pain and or your leg pain. So let's just go. So here we go, Dr. Boggy. <clears throat> Let's explain to the community of listeners uh, what's going on here. Perfect. So as you mentioned before, 80% of people will have back pain at some point in their life. So I think this is something that we absolutely need to discuss. And starting with the anatomy is great because the spine can certainly be complicated. So this is the spine in its entirety from the pelvis all the way up to the cervical spine here. And this is looking at it from the front. So the pelvis is here. And this here is the lumbar spine. And that's very important to know how close they are to each other because they're related to each other intimately. And hip pathology can certainly influence spine pathology. And once we go above the lumbar spine, we get to the thoracic spine. That's the middle portion here where the ribs are attached. People tend to have less issues in that area because the ribs keep that part of the spine stable. And then the cervical spine is up here and that's something we're definitely going to have to discuss in the future. So this is looking at the spine from the side. Now, this patient would be looking towards me, and these are the lower lumbar levels here, and then the upper lumbar levels here. So the important things to know here is that this is towards the front of the spine. This is where the abdomen is. And each one of these white boxes you can think of as building blocks. Those are the vertebral bodies. And those are what support the spine. In between that, they have uh, discs here, and that is what we move through in the front of our spine. And we can certainly have pathology within the 
discs, and we'll certainly talk about that later, things like disc herniations and disc degeneration. Then here on this model, these yellow lines coming out, those are the nerves. And the nerves can also be affected. They can get pinched either by a disc herniation or by arthritis, which can cause narrowing around the nerves. And then this here is the back of the spine. Each one of these bumps here are the bumps you can feel in your own spine when you touch your back. And this here is gonna be an important structure. So coming down from that spinous process to here is called the lamina. And the lamina is gonna be important because that is something that we often uh, remove during surgery. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. And here you can see again, the nerve coming out underneath the lamina. And this part right here is gonna be important because that's something called the pars. And we'll talk about that later, but people can get pars fractures, which can lead to slips of the bone. That's called spondylolisthesis. And then you can see here, this part coming down and this part coming up, that's the facet joint. That's the joint in the back of the spine. And that's what we move through, like Dr. Kale is showing here. And then another thing to look at is this yellow structure right here. And that runs all the way up and down the spine. So that's the spinal cord and then the nerves. So the spinal cord ends at L1 or L2 in most people. After that, it's just the nerves coming down before they exit out to go to the legs. And that part is called the cauda equina. And we'll touch on that a little bit later too, but cauda equina is the Latin name for horse's tail. And it just looks like that as the nerves come down. And so on this model, if we turn it over towards you, we can actually see here a disc herniation. And this would be actually considered a far lateral disc herniation. And we'll get into that when we talk about disc herniations in more detail. But you can see here that the nerve is passing right by it. And the nerve can get pinched by that disc herniation. And that can cause pain that is both in the back here and then goes down the buttocks and down the leg. And so that's basically the anatomy of the bones and the nerves in the spine. The final thing for us to look at is the posture of the spine. And this is extremely important. And so this would be a view looking at it front to back again. And normally the spine should be straight. It shouldn't have any curvature here. If there is curvature in the spine, this is what we call scoliosis. And this is curvature in the coronal plane, which is the plane we're looking at right now. And scoliosis can either be something that we develop when we're younger, specifically in our teenage years, or it could be something that happens as we get older. So what happens in that case is that these discs, they tend to wear out more on one side than the other. And if we get that at multiple levels, we're gonna get a curvature in that direction. And as you can imagine, if this spine is curving towards me, then this nerve can get pinched by the bones on its way out. And then the second way that we look at the posture is from the side. And so if we're looking at the spine like this, here it actually should have curvature to it. So in our lower back, which is here, our lumbar spine, we should have something called lordosis. That's when the spine bends backwards like this. And then in the middle part of our spine, we should have something called kyphosis. That's when the spine bends forward just like Dr. Kale is showing there. And then finally in our lumbar spine, we should have lordosis again, where it bends backwards. And the main thing here is that those three different curvatures looking at the spine from the side will keep our head centered over our pelvis. The reason that's important is that we're using the least amount of energy to keep our head centered over the pelvis when the spine has these three curves to it. When we have some issues with that, then generally our head tends to be pitched forward relative to our pelvis. And that increases the amount of energy our lower back muscles have to use to keep our back straight. And that can lead to a lot of back pain, specifically when people are standing and doing things such as laundry or the dishes or cooking. And same situation here. And so as Dr. Kale is showing, we're now looking at the spine a little bit bent over to the side so when we look at it front to back, uh, when the head is not centered over the pelvis, again, the body is using more energy to pull it back into that central position. 
Are there ligaments and muscles attached to these bony structures? There are, and those are actually extremely important. So if we look at the spine from the side again, there are very strong ligaments that attach between each one of these spinous processes here. And those are called the interspinous ligaments. And they're a very strong structure that actually comes into play when we're dealing with trauma. A lot of times, traumatic injuries can be treated without surgery, but these ligaments are actually so strong that one of the signs pushing us towards surgery is when these ligaments back here are disrupted. And then in terms of the muscles, that's also extremely important. So the muscles of the back attach to the spine and they run up and down the spine. And so those are the lumbar paraspinals here and the thoracic paraspinals here. Of course, the cervical paraspinals up here. And those tend to be the muscles that are affected the most when we have back pain that's related to muscles. We also have a muscle that runs from our lower back down through our pelvis and attaches to the front of our hip called the iliopsoas muscle. And that's extremely important in terms of why different positions of the hip, such as hip flexion or extension, can contribute to decreasing or increasing back pain. And there is certain conditions like disc herniations and spinal stenosis that we'll touch on why that muscle is so important. Wow, there's so many anatomical structures in this area. There's clearly bone, there's disc, there's ligament, there's muscles, there's nerves. It sounds like probably each one of these anatomical structures in some way can contribute to either back pain or leg pain. Certainly, that's very So true. let's just dive in and, and explore some of the more common uh, conditions that may be contributing. So when we talk about back pain and leg pain, why are we even talking about that in the same conversation? That's a great question. And I think one of the fundamental things about spine surgery and spine pain, and spine health in general, is that a lot of the symptoms don't seem like they would be coming from the spine. And so a lot of patients will have leg symptoms and they'll think it's coming from a leg issue. Is it the hip? Is it a knee? Is it the ankle? But a lot of times it's actually coming from the spine. And the reason for that is that the spine is where the nerves come out of. And so if there's an issue there that's compressing a nerve, it'll feel like it's a leg symptom or leg pain. And so I think that's the key in terms of why we always have to think about, is my leg pain coming from my back. That's great, great information. So as a physician, you all know, uh, we all know, and uh, that it's very crucial for us to take an adequate history, right? We like to listen to our patients. Again, you know, they teach us in medical school that 90% of the diagnosis can be formed just by listening to our patients, giving us their, their chief complaint and listening to the history of the present illness. What, some, what are some types of questions uh, that you'd like to ascertain from our patients uh, when, when trying to determine whether or not their symptoms are coming from their back? So Dr. Friedland actually uh, expounded on this in the inaugural podcast, and I think nothing could be closer to the truth that the history is the most important part of determining what is causing the patient's symptoms? And there are really so a few key questions that help us find out what that is. And with that, we can basically know what's causing their symptoms without even getting any additional uh, imaging or even without the physical exam. Now, of course, those things help us refine what's going on and then really pinpoint it. But the history gets us, as you said, 90% of the way there. So some important questions are the age of the patient. The reason that's important is that patients who are older tend to have more degenerative or arthritic conditions. They also tend to be more prone to compression fractures due to softening of the bone as they age. Also, younger patients tend to have a few specific things that we look for, like sports or overuse injuries to the muscle, things such as scoliosis, and then something called spondylolisthesis uh, caused by a pars fracture. Now that's something that sort of bridges the gap. It can be seen in younger patients who are very active, and then it can also be seen in older patients who've had a trauma. So that's, that's extremely important. Then as we touched on before, knowing whether it's back and leg pain 
or just one or the other is extremely important because that helps pinpoint what the cause may be in the back. And then as I touched on a little bit with spondylolisthesis, trauma is important because it sort of puts us into that mindset of, is this a high force injury going through the back? Could it be a fracture? Could it be shifting of the bones? Or is it something that's more like a strain of the muscle? Mm -hmm. And so it really gets us uh, thinking about those more high uh, energy issues. And then there's a few things that we don't want to miss. You know, it, it, it's not very common to have something such as a tumor that's causing pain, but it's also something we don't want to miss. And so questions that help pinpoint that are things such as, has a patient lost a lot of weight recently and they haven't been trying to? Have they had a change in appetite? Are they having fevers or chills? And those last two questions can also tell us if a patient might have an infection in their back. And that's something that we see a little bit less commonly, but we certainly see. Mm -hmm. And then there's also questions that we want to ask to make sure we don't have any serious thing that we want to act on quickly. And that's uh, asking questions such as, are there any changes in bowel or bladder function? Because we can see that when the spinal cord or the nerves that run up and down the spine are being compressed. We also want to ask, is there any numbness in the legs? Or specifically something called saddle anesthesia. And that's numbness in the perineal area. And that is also a sign that the spinal cord or the nerves that are running down the center of the spine are being compressed. And again, these are things that we don't want patients to have. And if they do have them, we want to act on it quickly. Then we start talking about questions that are potentially uh, asking about nerve compression. And so that can be things such as numbness or tingling into the legs. That can be questions such as, is there pain shooting down into the legs? And, and then there's questions that really help us pinpoint which specific issue it is. And that's really getting into the everyday life of the patient. That's asking about, do they feel better if they're leaning over? Do they feel better when they're standing? Do they feel better if they're walking up a hill or down a hill? And we'll get a little bit more into the specifics of why that matter later. Uh, and then we also want to know, uh, you know, about things that the patient is doing currently. So are they taking any medications at home for this? Are they doing any exercises for this? Uh, have they you know, seen any specialists before for things that often contribute to back symptoms, like a rheumatologist in terms of bringing together an inflammatory arthritis? I think th those are all important questions that help us pinpoint. Are there other types of conditions outside the field of orthopedic surgery that potentially can present with very similar symptoms like balance and equilibrium issues, tripping and falling, that sometimes you have to refer out to other specialists? Yeah, great question. And so to get to the spine side of why that might happen, so balance issues, tripping, and being off coordination can be things that we see with spinal cord compression, both in the neck and the middle back, the thoracic spine. And then we can also see it with compression of the nerves in the lower back, which is that cauda equina area we were talking about. But we can also start to have balance issues and equilibrium issues with different pathology in the brain and also with actual pathology for the nerves itself. And so one example of that is something called hydrocephalus. And that's when the spinal fluid is not being is not flowing out of the brain as it should, so it's getting blocked. And that can lead to extra pressure within the skull itself, and that can lead to very similar symptoms. And so usually for that, we have patients see a neurosurgeon, and for nerve issues, we have patients see a neurologist. And so it's definitely a team effort. Absolutely. I remember when I was in training, uh, it was really, really emphasized to us that kids really don't complain of back pain that much. So anytime a child uh, or a young adult um, complained of back pain, it, I was always trained to take that very, very seriously. Adults complain of back pain all the time. We get arthritic, degenerative, decondition, deconditioned, and um, you know it's, it's much more common in the adult population. But uh, there are things in the pediatric population that we certainly don't want to miss. And so I think it's important to uh, communicate to our listeners that if any of their children 
uh, are complaining of back pain, it definitely warrants, at least, uh, as, especially if it's a somewhat chronic, um, they should take those complaints seriously and uh, see an expert like yourself so that it can be adequately worked up because kids don't typically complain of back pain. And when they do, I just think it's important to uh, see an orthopedic spine surgeon to get assessed to make sure that certain things don't get missed. And uh, especially if they're complaining of uh, night pain as well. Typically in, in the field of orthopedic surgery in general, pain that wakes a patient up at night often can be an ominous sign. And it can suggest that certain things are going on that need to be worked up. Uh, there are other things uh, like Dr. Boggy alluded to, fever, chills, unintentional weight loss, but definitely night pain is a concerning complaint and we need to know about it. We need to see that patient and work that up to make sure that nothing bad is, is going on. Um, and so that's very important to emphasize. Do you agree with that, Dr. Boggy? I agree completely. So in terms of young patients, especially kids who aren't teenagers yet, back pain is extremely rare. So I think it's extremely important to have kids be seen by an orthopedic surgeon if they're having any type of back or even neck pain. Kids who are a little bit older, who are in their teenage years, can certainly have some back pain if they're very active. If they're playing sports, they can strain a muscle. But that's generally something that gets better very quickly. And so those patients will usually feel fine after a couple of days. It usually doesn't even take them a week or two. If it is taking them longer to get better than that, then I would also recommend they get seen by an orthopedic surgeon because they can have something that we alluded to earlier, which is a pars fracture. And so pars fractures are a break of the connection between the joint that's above a level and the joint that's below a level. And when that breaks, it can cause a lot of pain, but in general, it gets better quickly. But it's very important to be seen because then we can tailor with our physical therapists, our chiropractors in the office, a plan to get them back to sports. And a lot of times kids will be in a position when they're being scouted or they're in their senior year and it's extremely important that they perform at their highest level. And so if they're seen, we can get them back to sports usually within six weeks, even with a fracture in their back. And the other reason to get seen quickly is that when you do have a fracture of that area, the pars, sometimes it can lead to a slip between the bones, which is that spondylolisthesis we mentioned earlier. And that's something we want to avoid and certainly not happen in kids. 100%. So Dr. Boggy, we talked about earlier how sometimes people can only have back pain and sometimes people can present with only leg pain. But there are conditions that can contribute to back pain and leg pain. When do patients sometimes have back pain and when do patients sometimes have leg pain and when do they have both conditions? And before we even get into that, why is it important to distinguish if patients have lower back pain and only lower back pain or leg pain and only leg pain or both? Why is that important? This is a great question. And the reason is it really determines how successful treatment is going to be. And that's not just surgical treatment, but it's also interventional treatment with injections and also all of the other conservative treatments that we have in the practice, such as acupuncture, chiropractic treatments, and physical therapy. And the reason this is so important is that when we have either leg pain or a combination of leg and back pain, those are conditions that we are much more successful at treating. When patients come in with just isolated lower back pain, that's the most difficult thing to treat. And the reason for that is that there are multiple different causes of lower back pain. It can be degeneration of the disc, which can cause what's called discogenic back pain. It can be arthritis in the facet joints, and it can also be stenosis of the nerves in the center of the spine, as well as compression of the nerves as they exit. All of those things together can cause back pain. It's more the later two that I mentioned, the compression of the nerves in the center, as well as the compression of the nerves as they exit, which tend to cause more of that leg pain. And the reason that treatment for that is more effective is that if we can free up those nerves or decompress them, then patients usually have significant relief. 
of the leg symptoms. That's a very, very good point to emphasize, and I'm glad you elaborated so so eloquently about that because it's important for us when we're seeing patients to make it clear to them that we are very successful as orthopedic surgeons in addressing leg symptoms because leg symptoms tend to imply neurological compression, compression of nerves, and it's relatively easy for us to surgically remove that compression on the nerves and or put some steroidal medication around those compressed nerves to make them feel better. So leg pain is much easier to handle than chronic back pain because for all the reasons Dr. Boggy mentioned, back pain can come from a whole plethora of different conditions. There are so many different anatomical structures that he so beautifully outlined that can all contribute to that back pain. And it's less of a guarantee for us to be able to alleviate that back pain as it is leg pain. Certainly there are many different modalities that we can employ in helping patients address back pain from physical therapy to acupuncture, to massage, to chiropractic, to epidural steroid injections and different other treatment modalities that he mentioned. But when a patient has leg pain, we're much more optimistic about being able to satisfy them and alleviate their symptoms. So speaking of those anatomical structures, let's go through them one by one and let's talk about the different structures that you so beautifully outlined before and, and elaborate as to how they may contribute to the patient's back pain and or leg pain. Let's start first with the muscles. Yeah, so muscle-related back pain is the most common form of back pain. And it's usually related to an overuse injury. And this could be from something such as lifting furniture, if you're moving, lifting a box, or it can be from playing sports, or it could be from not having exercised in a while and then getting back into it. And usually what happens is there's inflammation of the muscle body itself, and it's sitting right there on top of the spine. So people will usually feel like it's coming from their back or it could be coming from the spine. The good thing about this is most of the time it gets better with conservative treatment. So most patients will have relief in two or three weeks from just rest, modifying their activities, and perhaps some over-the-counter anti-inflammatories. Now, if that doesn't cut it, then that's when we usually see them. And I think it's important to get these patients in to see an orthopedic surgeon early because If it's something else, then we can coordinate that care and get them what they need. And if it really is a muscle strain, then we can get them to the right place. And the three things that really help the most with that after rest and modifying the activities in the beginning are physical therapy, chiropractic treatments, and acupuncture. And we have all of that in the practice. The best part about that is that we communicate with each other and they let me know how the patient is doing and then I can adjust the care based on that. So I think that's something wonderful that we have. So it sounds like that's the best type of back pain to have, either sprains and strains of ligaments and muscles, uh, because it sounds like those conditions get better. A lot of times it's just uh, palliative care, physical therapy, and and teaching patients uh, postural exercises and conditioning those muscles and and soft tissue structures to uh, to improve their posture and 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 uh, often we can treat those with anti-inflammatories as well sometimes i guess when uh, patients fail to improve uh, quickly we can also supplement that in the office with myofascial trigger point injections trigger point injections are, are so common and, and and they're very effective because uh, when that muscle goes into spasm almost where the patient can feel like a knot in the muscle belly very often we can help alleviate that pain and spasm with an anti-inflammatory injection. So that's helpful. What about the disc that you mentioned earlier um, in the anatomy lesson, that intervertebral disc? Talk about the anatomy of that disc again, the structure of it, its function, and how it potentially can cause back pain and leg pain. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, Dr. Kale, there's two parts to the disc. There's the outside ring, which is called the annulus, and it's made up of type one collagen, which is a very tough fiber. The inside portion of the disc is called the nucleus pulposus. And that's the soft portion of the disc, similar to a cushion on a chair. And that's what provides the support. And that's where compression goes through. 
when we're bending or when we're jumping and even everyday things such as walking. And that portion is made out of, of type two collagen, which actually holds a lot of water. And that water is what creates a lot of that compressibility. And so we can have issues when two things happen. One, we can have degeneration of that type two collagen in the nucleus pulposus itself. And that can cause wearing down of the cushion so that it becomes a little bit harder. So it doesn't support the same compressive forces that it should. The second thing that can happen is that we can have weakness in the annulus itself. So that type one collagen, it's actually very prone to injury at the edges. And so not so much in the center, but right at the edge of where the nerve is starting to exit. And that's sort of why patients have issues with disc herniations causing both leg and back pain. And so the reason for that is if we have a tear in the annulus, the first thing that can happen is the inflammatory material on the inside can leak out and that can cause a lot of inflammation in that area. And that can cause irritation of the nerve that's sitting right there, which can cause both back pain localized and leg pain in that nerve distribution. Or we can actually have a piece of disc come out. So once that nucleus pulposus starts to wear out some, it's very prone to coming out. Now, when there's a tear in the annulus, it can actually come out of there and compress the nerve itself. Like this model. Exactly. And so this, this area right here, that is an, a piece of the disc that's coming out and pushing on the nerve. And that's exactly what will happen. And just as is shown here, the disc herniation tends to be either here where it's shown or a little bit more towards the center, but not too much. And that actually tends to be why patients will often have one-sided symptoms with a disc herniation. So the back pain will be on one side and the leg pain will also be on one side because the nerve on the other side is not affected. Does everyone with this disc herniation need surgery? Luckily, most patients don't need surgery. So 90% of patients will get better with conservative treatment. And so generally what happens is patients who are usually between their 20s and 40s will present with this. The most common age group is in the 40s because there's some wearing out of that annulus by then. And this can happen with even slight trauma. Usually when patients are younger in their 20s, it's something such as a car accident or a lifting incident that causes this. And so patients often will have extreme pain for the first couple of days. Plenty of patients end up in the emergency room because of how much it hurts. And that's because of all that inflammatory material that's right around the nerve. Generally, that's treated with uh, initially anti-inflammatories, sometimes with steroids if it's severe enough, although we tend to want to stay away from that to protect the bones. And then patients will usually start to feel better, even in that first week. If they're continuing to have some residual symptoms, we will often start physical therapy, chiropractic treatment, and acupuncture at that time. And that'll really help to strengthen the core and start to take the pressure off the nerve and the disc. If the pain continues after that, the next step is usually a corticosteroid injection into this area right here. So that's either an epidural, which goes here, which is where the nerves are running up and down. And the epidural is just that space where the nerves are. And patients often ask me, is an epidural the same thing that women get when they're pregnant? It's the same space where the injection goes. But the difference is that usually when women are pregnant, a catheter is also inserted into the area so that they can have numbing medicine over a longer period of time, while an injection is just a single shot, like getting a trigger point shoulder injection. And what it does is it counteracts all the inflammatory material that comes out of the disc space. That cuts down the inflammation and patients can usually feel significantly better even as soon as that steroid kicks in in three to five days. Only if patients continue to have pain after that do we consider something such as surgery. The only other time we consider surgery earlier is if patients are having concerning symptoms. And that specifically is something such as weakness. And so each one of these nerves controls a different muscle in the leg. And so if a patient is having weakness in the same nerve that's being compressed, such as having a foot drop, and then we want to do surgery, surgery earlier because we can decompress the nerve and give it the best chance of recovering. There's one other situation where we might want to do something earlier, and that's something called cauda equina syndrome. That's something that's relatively uncommon, 
less than 5% of disc herniations lead to cauda equina syndrome. That's when the disc herniation happens in the center. And the reason it's so rare is because that annulus is strong in that central portion. But when it does happen, it causes very severe and concerning symptoms. So things to look out for are weakness in both of the legs rather than one, pain, numbness, or tingling again in both of the legs, and then either saddle anesthesia, which is that numbness in the perineal area, and bowel or bladder issues, specifically incontinence, which is where you don't know that you have to go to the bathroom. When that happens, we want to decompress that area and take the pressure off the nerves within 48 hours. The research shows that people have the most recovery of function if we get to it that quickly. Yeah. Dr. Boggy, what are the most common levels for disc herniations in the lumbar spine? The two most common levels are L4-5, which is the second lowest level, and L5-S1, which is the lowest level. The reason for that is that the most pressure from the spine is right on those two discs. And so they tend to be the ones that have an issue if there's going to be one. It's much less common to have it at the levels above. It can happen. And one important thing is that the spinal canal actually gets narrower as we get higher in the spine. And so there's less room. So even one of those two one side or unilateral disc herniations can cause symptoms of cauda equina that we just discussed when it's a higher level. Also, the spinal cord actually ends at L1 or L2, and after that, it's the nerves. So right at that area at L1 and L2, the spinal cord isn't very mobile. And so when there's compression on it, people can get very severe symptoms. And so if you have those severe symptoms, you know, definitely come and get checked out. Do you feel that these, some of these disc herniations can go back in place with physical therapy? So the body can actually work to break down the disc. So the piece of disc material that comes out can be broken down by macrophages. And so it's enzymatic degradation of that disc material. And it actually tends to be more likely to happen in a disc that actually has come all the way out of the annulus. So we can have a bulging of the disc and the annulus with the intact annulus that can push on a nerve and cause symptoms. But we can also have a tear, as we discussed, and a piece actually come out. So when the piece comes all the way out, it's more likely to be broken down by the body because it recognizes it as something that's not supposed to be there. And so what physical therapy does is it strengthens the core and the lower back, and it takes the pressure off the discs. And it gives the body time and the ability to break that disc down. Yeah. Yeah, the body treats it as a foreign body. It doesn't want it there, and it mounts that inflammatory response, right, to try to get it to resorb it. The way I've always explained it to my patients, it's sort of a race between the, the, the disc herniation resorbing uh, versus our ability to manage your pain or develop potential nerve injury to the point where we have to have the surgery. And so, um, you know, it's, it's somewhat controversial, but uh, we always do our best to help manage the pain and, and, and hope that the patient never develops that nerve injury. Um, what are some of the uh, manifestations of uh, a, a large disc herniation uh, that's compressing the nerve that would make you probably want to operate on that patient sooner uh, than one that you would uh, maybe opt to treat conservatively? So there's three kinds of disc herniations when you look at it on an MRI in terms of the size and in terms of whether the annulus is torn. So there is a disc that's just bulging and pushing on a nerve. There is a disc that is partway inside the disc space and partway out, which is called an extruded disc. And then there's one that's completely out. Those tend to migrate. They'll go up or they'll go down the spinal canal. And when that happens, specifically when it comes out of the disc space, it tends to really compress the nerve because there's not a lot of room as you go away from the disc space. So right where the disc is, is where the nerve exits. So sometimes if the disc herniation is just in the right spot, it can push on the nerve and cause pain, but it's not compressing it up against bone. As you go more up or down the canal, there's nothing there except for bone. And so you have to think of it similar to a subway tunnel. There's something in there. There's nowhere for anything in there to go. And so the nerve can get compressed. And patients will generally have very severe lower back pain 
often they'll say it's at their upper buttocks. That's where they'll feel it, especially when it's L4-5 or L5-S1. And then from there, it'll go down the leg. It'll generally be down the buttocks and down the back of the leg into the calf and the bottom of the foot if it's S1. And it can be the front of the lower leg and then the top of the foot if it's L5. And weakness will go usually in the same area, that lower part of the leg. It'll usually be with ankle dorsiflexion, which is ankle up, or ankle plantar flexion, which is ankle down. And actually, the L5 nerve, the only muscle that it innervates just by itself is the muscle that brings the big toe up. And so a lot of times patients will actually only have weakness of the big toe. And it's something they won't recognize because we don't use our big toe extensor much when we're walking. And, but it can be a sign that we should do something quickly so that we can protect that nerve. The reason is that that L5 nerve also goes to the ankle. And it also goes to ankle dorsiflexion, which is ankle up. And so over time, we can start to get weakness with that, which is what people refer to as a foot drop. The reason that's so important is that bringing our ankle up is extremely important when we walk. If we can't bring our ankle up, we start to trip because our ankle will drag and we'll need to bring our knee much higher when we walk. So we get a very characteristic gait where we bring our knee all the way up towards our hip and then the ankle is pointing down with the toes pointing down. So in terms of when we need to operate sooner rather than later, it's when we have weakness. So weakness is something we need to decompress. And the reason for that is that central part of the nerve, which carries the motor signals, it doesn't like to recover. So once it starts to get weak, there's already starting to be damage to that nerve. So the quicker we can take the pressure off of it, the more likely it is that the body can repair it and get our strength back. That was very beautifully articulated. Thank you for that. It sounds like some of the symptoms you're describing are consistent with that common condition that people call sciatica. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. And the reason for that is the sciatic nerve is actually made up of three of the nerves that come out of the back. And the three nerves specifically are the L4, L5, and S1 nerves. It actually is also made up of the S2 and S3 nerves, but those are not motor nerves. So for this, we'll talk about those three. And again, the most common disc herniations as we talked about before, are at L4-5 and L5-S1. So those three nerve roots here tend to be the ones that are affected. And of course, they come together to make up the sciatic nerve. So technically, it is the sciatic nerve that's an issue, but it's not the sciatic nerve in the leg itself. It's the nerve root, one of these three, that's the issue. And it's extremely important to know which nerve it is because patients will have symptoms in a different part of their leg even though it's similar. And then of course the surgery will be slightly different depending on where it is. Um, it, the sciatic nerve can also get compressed in the leg itself. So one other common cause of sciatic pain is piriformis syndrome. The piriformis is a muscle that runs in the leg itself and that can compress the nerve as it's passing by the piriformis. And that of course is not related to back pain, but it's something that is important to distinguish which one is causing their symptoms. While we're on this uh, anatomical model, what is this thing called the dorsal root ganglion? And is that relevant uh, when, when it comes to disc herniations? That's an excellent question. And it is because, so that's something you can see right here. And actually this disc herniation on this model would be pushing on the dorsal root ganglion or the DRG. The reason it's important is that it can be extremely painful. So it's where the body of the cells of the nerve are stored. And so when that's compressed, it can be more painful than if a different part of the nerve is compressed. So a lot of those patients, as I mentioned earlier, who end up in the emergency room when they have a disc herniation like this, have one that's pushing on the dorsal root ganglion. And the statistics are actually still the same. 90% of patients will still get better without surgery, but it's important that we get treatment started earlier so we can get patients feeling better. So the, it sounds like the location of the disc herniation is, is a critical uh, factor in identifying how severe the pain might be and where that pain may go. Yeah. So can you elaborate a little bit on, say, posterolateral disc herniations versus far lateral disc herniations? Yeah. So anatomically, that's extremely important because in the lumbar spine, uh, 
the nerves actually go down one level and then they exit. And so when we have more of that central or paracentral, which is right off to the side, we get the nerve that's passing down to the level below it. So for example, if we had a disc herniation at the L4-5 level that was central or paracentral, we would get the L5 nerve as it was passing down. Versus if it was a far lateral disc such as this, it gets the nerve that's actually exiting at that level. So if we had a far lateral disc herniation at L4-5, it would be compressing the L4 nerve. And that becomes extremely important during surgery because we would be decompressing it differently. So to get into that a little bit, to free up a disc herniation and a nerve that's more in the center here, which is the more common type, we make a small window in the bone here, we move the nerve to the side and we take out that piece of disc, similar to taking a pebble out of a shoe. So we don't do anything with the rest of the disc that's in the disc space. So it doesn't lead to any increased disc degeneration. Doing surgery for a disc herniation doesn't lead to any increased risk of having a fusion surgery in the future. Any risk of that happened when the disc herniation happened, when the injury to the disc itself happened. When we do a far lateral disc like this, we actually don't go through the center here. We go around the side and we move this nerve over and we take that piece of disc out. And both of these procedures are done minimally invasively, very small incisions. We use a microscope and patients go home the same day. Wow. I remember our last podcast speaking to Dr. Friedland. People would be admitted for traction for weeks uh, until that condition resolved, hopefully resolved. So we've made some tremendous advancements in the field of spine surgery. It's very impressive. Uh, speaking of minimally invasive surgery, uh, how big are the incisions typically for a lumbar disc herniation uh, that's undergoing a microscopic discectomy? Incisions are usually a centimeter. Impressive. A one centimeter incision. And sometimes you're doing some of these surgeries uh, even through micro like very small tubes as well, right? Yeah, that's actually what lets us keep the incision so small. And so we can use tubes that are slightly bigger with each tube that we use. And that lets us dilate or expand the muscle without making a big incision. And then once we're done, that muscle just sits right back where it's supposed to. And so very minimal back pain, very minimal muscle-related pain after surgery, usually only a few days. Yeah. Well, a lot of patients obviously get very nervous about undergoing any type of spine, spine surgery. Uh, at the Kale Orthopedic Center, it's always been my belief, and I know it is yours too, Paul, that that uh, m most of the time uh, we employ the expertise also of a board certified neurosurgeon. So at the Kale Orthopedic Center, when our spine surgeons are, are doing spine surgery on our patients, we're always working with uh, board certified neurosurgeons as well. And, like, and likewise, when, when they uh, undergo uh, surgical procedures with their patients, they very often call upon the expertise of our spine surgeons like Dr. Paul Boggy. We just feel it's the, the safest for our patients to have two fellowship trained spine surgeons taking care of our, our, our patients with two uh, specialized training uh, in different fields of their expertise of neurosurgery and orthopedic spine surgery. And I, I just always felt that and uh, Dr. Boggy feels the same and uh, they've had a tremendous, tremendous success in the surgical management of our patients. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about some of the degenerative uh, spinal conditions that can also present with some back and leg pain as well. One of which you alluded to before, you talked about degenerative spondylosis, degenerative disc disease, facet arthrosis, but more commonly, let's talk about this condition that seems to be fairly ubiquitous in the elderly population called Spinal stenosis, also known as neurogenic claudication or shopping cart syndrome. Can you, can you speak to that condition? Yeah, spinal stenosis is the most common cause of back and leg pain in patients over the age of 65. And what it is, is narrowing around the nerves as they run up and down the spine. As we mentioned earlier with the subway tunnel, there's not a lot of room there. And so what patients can get over time is degeneration of the disc, which can start to bulge backwards towards the nerves. They can get overgrowth of the facet joints, 
So what happens is the body is trying to repair the facet joints and the cartilage in there, and instead it's creating bone spurs. And those can grow towards the nerves in the center. And then we can also get thickening of a ligament in the back. And we were talking about some of the ligaments. There's another ligament that sits right behind the nerves. And when we get thickening of that, along with the bone spurs and the disc bulges, we don't have a lot of space left for the nerves as they run up and down. All those things together can cause back pain. And the narrowing around the nerves is what causes the leg pain. In terms of the leg pain, that's what's referred to as neurogenic claudication. And it's a fancy word, but neurogenic just means from the nerves, and claudication means pain when you walk. Now, it doesn't always have to be pain. Patients will describe it in different ways. They'll say they have pain in their legs when they walk, or they'll say their legs feel heavy, or their legs feel tired. And then most commonly what they'll say is, I can't walk very far because of the leg symptoms and the back symptoms, and I have to stop and sit down. And they'll also say, I feel better when I'm leaning forwards, and that's the shopping cart sign. And so patients will say when they go to the grocery store, they feel great. They can walk around the store because they're leaning forward over a shopping cart. And it doesn't have to be a shopping cart. It could be over a walker. That will help patients a lot as well. The reason for that is when we flex forward, we actually open up the space for our nerves in the back. And we can see that on the model here. And so when Dr. Kale takes it and extends the model, we can actually see the space for the nerves here is becoming narrow and patients will have more symptoms. But when you flex forward in this direction, the space for the nerves in the back will increase and patients will have fewer symptoms. And this actually is the big differentiator between two different kinds of claudication. And yeah, you can, of course, you can see with that right in this area here, how much less space there is for the nerves when you're extending. So there's two kinds of claudication. There's neurogenic claudication and there's vascular claudication. And there's a few specific differences between the two. So vascular claudication happens when there's ischemia to the muscle. So we're not getting enough blood flow. And what happens is anything where we're more active, the muscle's more metabolically active and it requires more energy and nutrients. And so when we're walking, we'll get vascular claudication as well. So the difference between the two, however, you can notice is when you're on a bike, you're still being metabolically active. You're working your legs, but you're flexed forward sitting on the bike. And so people with neurogenic claudication will actually feel great when they're biking. Mm -hmm. Also, you can think of it when people are walking up a hill or down a hill. So when people are walking up a hill, they're using more energy to go up that hill. So with vascular claudication, they'll tend to feel worse. But with neurogenic claudication, they'll feel better. The other difference between neurogenic and vascular claudication happens when we're going down a hill. So when we're going down a hill, our center of gravity is towards the front. And so we tend to extend our back. When we're doing that, we're actually making symptoms of neurogenic claudication worse. And so those are the differences between vascular and neurogenic claudication. Now, talking about, back to the causes of it. So spinal stenosis, uh, showing you on the model here. So as we mentioned, what happens is these nerves that are running up and down, the spine get compressed. And you would think that if there's compression on the spinal nerves like that, that you would have to decompress them to make them better. The good news is that in most cases, we can actually make patients significantly better without surgery. And so the treatment for that is modifying the activities and anti-inflammatories initially, and then starting to strengthen the muscles that support the spine, which is another reason why they're so important. So we start with core, which are the muscles in the front, and lower back, which are the paraspinal muscle strengthening. What that does is it improves our posture and it takes the pressure off the nerves. And so if that gives us relief, then usually that's enough to avoid surgery. If that's not enough, oftentimes actually adding in chiropractic treatment and acupuncture can help take patients the rest of the way there. Now, unfortunately, when that's not enough, then we have to consider something such as surgery. But the good thing is that most of the time we can do a surgery that patients recover from relatively well. And so that's something called a laminectomy, and that's decompressing the nerves here. So what we do is we take this bone, this bone, 
this bone off depending on which levels are compressed. So we can have spinal stenosis at one level, or we can have it at multiple levels. And we can de decompress as many as we need to within the lumbar spine. What that does is it basically takes the roof off of that tunnel and it gives the nerves that are running in it room. And generally patients have significant improvement in symptoms within four to six weeks. So when initially patients couldn't even walk down the hallway or couldn't walk from their front door to their car, now they're able to walk one, two, three plus miles in just a couple of weeks. And the other great thing is that most of the time we don't have to put any hardware in there. So no metal, no screws, and no rods. And just taking the pressure off the nerves will relieve most of those symptoms of neurogenic claudication. Why is that? It's, it seems counterintuitive that you're taking away so much bone. Why isn't the spine unstable if you take away all that bone, if all these ligaments are attached to these posterior spinous processes? That's a great question. So when we look at the spine from the side, you can see these vertebral bodies in the front. Those are the building blocks of the spine. So this anterior column here supports most of the spine. Then the second part of our support comes through these facet joints here, which is what we move through. And if we can preserve 50% of each one of those facets, then doing surgery and taking the bone off the back doesn't destabilize the spine. The ligaments are certainly important, but not so much so that they will destabilize it. Now, the only time when we do have to consider fusing a level is when there's already instability. And so that's when the bones are already slipped on each other, which is spondylolisthesis. So when that happens, it's a sign that the bones, the discs, and the joints aren't strong enough to hold the bones in place. They're already starting to slip. So in those cases, we'll usually fuse that level, which means we put screws in from the back through this channel of bone called the pedicle into the front with rods connecting the two segments so that there's no motion here. The reason that's important is if that bone continues to slip over time, what can happen is it can cause pinching of those nerves again, just by the slippage. Hmm. Does that change the post-operative rehab protocol if somebody ends up having a fusion as opposed to just what we call a, a spinal decompression? Yeah, so it does somewhat. And the reason for that is we want the bones to heal now that we've put hardware into it. And so generally it's a little bit longer before we start doing strength training. So with just a decompression or a laminectomy, we start walking the day of surgery and we start range of motion and stretching the next day. And then we start strengthening six weeks later. The difference between that and a spinal fusion is that we still are walking patients that same day and we're still starting some range of motion and stretching the following day but we don't do any heavy lifting, twisting, or bending for three months. And we don't start that strengthening of the muscles for three months. So that's the difference between the I two. See. So today with Dr. Boggy thus far, we've talked about uh, probably the three most common etiologies of lower back pain and leg pain that we see in orthopedics. We talked about the muscle and the ligaments, sprains and strains of the back, which is probably the most common. We talked about sciatica and lumbar disc herniation, which is probably the most common in the 20 to 40 year old patient population. And then finally, we just recently talked about spinal stenosis, neurogenic claudication, also known as shopping cart syndrome, which is most common in patients over 50 years of age. There are other sources of low back pain and leg pain that we'll briefly touch upon. Uh, because we spoke about the anatomical structure. So other things can cause injury or trauma or destruction of the bone and nerves uh, of the spine. What are some of the things uh, related to the bone that can also occur, say, after a trauma or other, other sources? Yeah, I think it's very important to talk about these few conditions we're going to touch on now. They may be rare, but when they do happen, it's something that we want to treat quickly. And oftentimes it's something that patients aren't thinking about. And so trauma is certainly one of those. So in younger patients, it usually requires high energy to cause any fracture of the lumbar spine. And this is usually something such as a fall from height, a car accident, something of that nature. 
because the bone quality is so good. Exactly. For patients who are older, it's actually the opposite. It's pretty easy to get a fracture. And in a lot of older patients who have softer bone, which is called osteoporosis, they can get compression fractures that happen from just lifting something light off the ground, sometimes even just getting out of a chair. And that's important for a few reasons. One, we want to treat the fracture itself. And then two, we want to treat the weakening of the bone. And so osteoporosis is something that we can treat very effectively. And preventing fractures like that in the future is extremely important. As we touched on earlier, the posture of the spine is extremely important. And so compression fractures at every level can cause, on average, a six degree increase in kyphosis. And so that's pushing our head forward from our pelvis. And so even if we heal from the compression fracture and that pain goes away, then we can start to have pain from the fact that the spine is no longer aligned. So those are the two general types of fractures, high energy, usually more serious fractures in younger patients that usually need surgery for stabilization. And then these lower force, lower energy uh, compression fractures in older patients that can usually be treated just with physical therapy, actually. What about the fairly common uh, fracture we see sometimes in the adolescent population um, that sometimes is an incidental finding that you alluded to earlier called a pars fracture? Can you just speak about that for, for a minute? Yeah, so pars fractures are very common in young athletes usually seen in young teenagers. So between the ages of 11 on the early side, all the way up to 16 or so on the later side. And it happens from repetitive trauma. And so it's seen, actually these days, it's seen in all patients who are active with sports. The common patients that we used to see it in were linebackers because they had a lot of flexion extension, blocking patients or blocking on the teams. And we also see it in gymnasts, uh, we see it in cheerleaders, we see it in rowers because of that back and forth motion. And so that repetitive trauma would cause a fracture of the pars, which is a piece of bone in the back as we were looking at earlier. And most times patients will have pain for a couple of days and they'll get better. Sometimes though, it'll last longer than that. So what can happen is if you were to look at an MRI, you'll see a lot of edema or swelling within the bone itself. And that's why that pain tends to last. And in those situations, the way we treat it is by stopping activities for a few weeks. So generally we stop activities for two weeks and then we get those patients back on a return to sport protocol. So over the next two to four weeks, so a total of four to six weeks, we can get patients back to full activity. And the reason for that is kids heal so well and so quickly. Sometimes that bone will heal instead of bone to bone it would scar in between. When that happens, generally patients are asymptomatic. They can go back to all sports and they don't have any issues. But that's something we will often see later down the line. So when patients are older, we'll often get an x-ray and we'll see a pars fracture and they won't have any symptoms. Perhaps we were getting the x-ray to look at something else and we see that that's called an incidental finding. And what can happen with that though is if there's a trauma, sometimes it can disrupt that scar and that can become symptomatic again. And sometimes in patients, it'll stay symptomatic with all of our conservative treatment and we'll have to do surgery to stabilize it because again, once we're older, we don't heal as well as we did when we were younger. Are you a believer in bracing for the pediatric pars fractures? That's a great question. So pars fractures can happen on one side or they can happen on both sides. And when patients have complete fractures on both sides, I'll brace them. And the reason for that is I want to prevent spondylolisthesis or the shifting of the bones on each other. When it tends to be on one side or more just edema without an actual fracture through it, I generally treat them without bracing because that unbroken bone is stable enough to prevent any slip once we pull them out of activities. How about infection? Can infections occur in and around the spine and the disc and the bone and And if so, how does that sometimes present and how do we have to treat those conditions? So infections tend to present with fevers, chills, night sweats. It's a pretty central part of the body. And so the body is responding to that infection there. And it tends to happen 
right at the edge of the disc and the bone. The reason for that is the blood supply to the vertebral body is not great. And so it's a very slow flow. And so bacteria can spread there from somewhere else. Sometimes it's something as benign as a cut and the bacteria can travel all the way to the spine. Usually it's something a little bit more than that. It can be an infection in a different part of the body, uh, or it could be something such as IV drug use. And that's something we have to pay attention to as physicians. And so once that happens, the infection starts right at the edge of the disc and the bone, and then it travels into the disc space. The disc space actually doesn't have any blood vessels. It gets all of its nutrients from diffusion from the bone. And that's actually another reason why the discs don't tend to heal well. Once the infection gets into that area, the body can't fight it well because we need our immune cells to get there through the blood and there isn't great blood supply. So it creates this nidus of infection within the disc and the bone right next to it. And that's often why it's called osteodiscitis because it affects both the bone and the disc. A lot of times this actually can be treated with antibiotics. So if patients aren't having concerning symptoms, which are weakness, uh, pain that we can't get better with anything else, or those symptoms of cauda equina symptoms, because what can happen is the infection can spread from the disc and the bone to the epidural space, which as we talked about earlier is that space around the nerves, and that can cause compression on the nerves. So if we have any of those things, we usually need to go in and decompress and clear out the infection. If not, usually IV antibiotics for six weeks can take care of it. Uh, some of the uh, blood work can be pretty positive with this. So 90% of the time, two inflammatory markers called ESR and CRP are positive. And so it's a very good test to pick this up. And actually we can see changes even on x-ray very early. So within seven to 10 days, we'll see loss of height of the disc and irregularity of the bone next to the disc space, even on x-ray. And of course, MRI will actually show us where the infection is, but this is usually something we can catch pretty early. Are disc space infections treated differently in the adult population than the pediatric population? So pediatric patients usually will get better with conservative treatment. You know, they're very, they're very robust and they're very good at healing. And so most of the time they'll get better. The reason that adults sometimes don't get better is as we get older and we have more comorbidities or other medical issues, there's other things that are going on that are preventing our body from healing ourselves. So diabetes is a great example. Diabetics are at a much higher risk of having this type of infection. And they're also at a much higher risk of not getting better with IV antibiotics. So the rate of surgery is much higher in that group of patients. Right. Well, that was very, very informative. The last topic I think we should talk about, need to talk about, but hate to talk about, unfortunately, is uh, tumors of the spine. Tumors can be, tumors are essentially just growths of tissue or bone in areas that uh, bone and tissue do not belong. Tumors can be either benign or malignant. When tumors are malignant, we call that cancer. Uh, cancer of the bone of the spine can be either primary or it can be metastatic to the spine. Uh, there are conditions that uh, are carcinomas or cancers that very often spread to the bone, spine included, and those are typically the breast cancers, lung cancers, thyroid cancers, kidney and prostate cancers. So whenever patients have any of those cancers, uh, we definitely, definitely, definitely want to make sure that the patient uh, doesn't have any bone metastasis. Um, how often do you see tumors of the spine, uh, Paul? And how often do you see primary tumors versus metastatic tumors, um, benign versus malignant? Uh, it, does that make up a significant portion of your practice? Or is it something, fortunately, that hopefully is rare in our practice? So fortunately, it is rare. It's rare in the general population as well. And most commonly when we see tumors in the spine, they're metastatic tumors, meaning they come from a different location. And as Dr. Kale mentioned, there's specific tumors that tend to go to bone. And it's the same for the spine. Same tumors tend to go there. And it's more common in patients who are over the age of 65. And primary tumors are more common in younger patients. And those can be broken up into two different 
parts. So one can be bone tumors and the other are generally considered neural tumors that are either in the nerve roots or in the spinal cord itself. And they can present with different symptoms. So generally tumors actually are not painful. It's actually destruction of bone caused by the tumor that causes pain. And neural tumors can be painful, usually because they're on a nerve and then they cause compression of that nerve. And they can cause similar nerve symptoms that we were discussing earlier, something such as a disc herniation. Luckily though, these are much less common. So most patients who are having back or leg pain will not have a tumor, but it is something that we don't wanna miss. So it's another reason why if you're having back pain or if you're having leg pain, and it's not getting better after a few weeks that you come and get checked out with us and an orthopedic specialist. Because even if it's rare, if we catch it early, we can treat it, especially primary bone tumors, depending on what they are. Metastatic bone tumors can be difficult to treat because it's a sign that it's already spread. And so generally it's a later stage when that happens. Uh, but again, it's not something we want to miss. Right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our time with Dr. Boggy today. I hope this podcast was very helpful for you. Uh, clearly, back problems and leg problems are ubiquitous in the uh, patient population that we see on a daily basis. And hopefully just uh, us touching on some of the anatomy and some of the more common conditions that we see and treat on a daily basis has encouraged you, if you're suffering from any of these conditions, to make sure you seek uh, the opinion of a medical expert that specializes in the treatment of spinal disorders. I hope you pay special attention to some of the more concerning complaints that we look out for, such as night pain, uh, decreased appetite, unintentional weight loss, fever, chills, etc. But certainly have a very low threshold to make an appointment with an orthopedic specialist to get assessed because we know the questions to ask, we know the images to obtain, uh, we know the physical exams to perform, to identify uh, conditions, and it's always better to be seen earlier and diagnose and treat these conditions earlier as opposed to when it's too late. So we appreciate your time uh, watching this podcast. I hope that you opt to subscribe to our po podcast and click the notification button so that every time these podcasts are broadcast, you are notified because our goal here is to educate our community of patients about common and maybe not so common musculoskeletal disorders so that we can educate you and identify symptoms and signs that uh, will alert you to see a medical expert sooner rather than later so that we can continue to take the best care that we can uh, to our community of, of patients. So thank you so much, Dr. Boggy, for your time. It was a pleasure speaking to you. I learned so much about uh, uh, your field of expertise, and I really enjoyed having you here today.